second to read our text together. It's good to see you. We probably could have had you in here at 10 o'clock, but I decided not to change it one more time. I figured I'd mess everyone up, and maybe you'd appreciate with the snow having a little extra time and a little extra sleep, perhaps, and time to clear out your homes. We're going to look at Matthew 12, verses 18 through 21, and we are actually echoing here the book of Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, but we find it's Christ speaking in the New Testament because, believe it or not, Christ is called the Word. Amen? And the Word is Jesus. So chapter 12 and verses 18 to 21 says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Father, we pray today that we would understand these statements and the parallels that are made as we walk before a holy God in a life that is very brief by your standards, but very long sometimes, especially during adversity, by our standards. Help us to understand the mind of Christ today. Help us to make application. Help us to leave here differently for the good than we came. We love you, we praise you, and we ask that you would just bless your people. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Bruised reeds and smoldering wicks is the title of the sermon today. I know that you don't talk about bruised reeds often. I know you don't talk about smoldering flax or smoldering wicks often, but when you think of flax, I want you to think of a wick on a candle that has been blown out and the flame is gone and it is simply smoldering. I used to impress young people in youth ministry when I would lick my fingers when they weren't looking and I would put out all the candles around the sanctuary and they said, how is it that he is never burned? But I had, that that was about the extent of my youth program, but uh, we had a great, great time together. This morning and always, we seek to take things in context. It is important for us to realize there is usually just one meaning in a verse of Scripture. One meaning, one application, even though sometimes we will bring forth several applications with one verse or one chapter of the Bible. I can think of one in particular. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him or have dinner with him, and he with me. Most people think that's a great salvation verse, and we use it for salvation. I have talked to little children, and I've said, Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart right now, but you've got to open up the door from the inside. But technically, this is Jesus talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And looking at the church of Laodicea because the church needs to open the door and allow Jesus Christ to come in because the church was in trouble. So we use that verse in several different ways and we're going to do the same thing with Matthew 12 verses 18 to 21 this morning. Technically, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, those who wanted him killed, those who did not accept that he was the Messiah, that he came to fulfill all prophecy. Remember when Christ said, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets? I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
Here he is technically letting the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and I would throw in carnal believers and the lost, he's letting them know that they are bruised reeds, they are smoking wicks, but because of his love and his mercy, he did not come as a judge the first time. He came as a savior. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came merely showing mercy and grace to people. But please understand, as he waits, even for the very hard-hearted to come to him, one day all will stand before him as a judge in two different places, and there are two different accounts in the Word of God. Christians will stand before Christ, and we will explain what we did with Jesus. And it will all be according to the gifts that God wants to give to us so that we might cast them back at his feet. Also, the lost will stand before him one day, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And if their names are not in that book of life, other books will be opened. And they will be judged according to their works. And I think you would agree, you don't want to be judged according to your works before a perfect God. That's why we rejoice in the blood of Christ being shed for us and making us right before the Lord. So Jesus the first time did not come to judge, but to give grace and to show that he was a merciful God. Would you agree we live in a throwaway society? You know, I'm not just talking about paper cups and recycling. I'm talking about people. We throw people away in our society. The downtrodden, the forgotten, are casualties usually because of hard bouts they have fought with life. And they've been forgotten. They have not received the support and the help that they need. Let me give you a definition of, smold of uh, bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. Reeds are common. Have you ever, even in Rhode Island, gone down by a lake or gone down by a swamp or gone down wherever there is a body of water and you see these high, very slim reeds blowing in the wind by that lake, by that swamp? Well, they have them in the Holy Land, too. Sometimes they grow up as high as 12 feet high. 12 feet high they grow. And they blow in the wind. They're actually quite beautiful. And sometimes, because of the constant wind blowing on them, they will almost come to the point of breaking, but they won't break. They'll kind of snap. They'll kind of bend in the wind. And what Christ was saying was, I'm comparing those reeds to you. You're bruised. You're almost broken. But I will not break a bruised weed, a bruised weed, or reed, I should say. I don't know, weed came to mind. But uh, he said, I will not break a bruised reed. People will. People will do away with you. People will cast away those that are hurting because they take too much time. These reeds can be used in different ways. In the Holy Land, they would break them down, and sometimes you'd see a shepherd boy walking behind sheep and swatting it, one of those lambs that wouldn't fall in line and wouldn't follow the rest of the flock, and he'd be there swatting it. I've seen that in some documentaries at times. Other people would take that reed and they would cut it down into a short reed, and they would play it as a musical instrument. Or they would cut it down to a short reed, um, and no implication to using the word weed earlier, and they would smoke something through that reed. Some people would do that over in the Holy Land and probably even here. There's all kinds of things that go on that I really don't want to know about. They were used for different reasons, but Jesus was lifting them up in a symbolic way. The smoldering wick it's easy to envision after you blow a candle out, the flame is gone and the smoke rises up from that wick. And after a while, it's just kind of smoldering. 
very close to going out, but Jesus said, I will not quench that wick that's only smoldering. Maybe you're bruised this morning. Maybe you're smoldering at best. You're maintaining life. You're putting a smile on your face. You're making like everything is cool, but it's not. You're near the point of breaking. You're near the point of your flame, which is just smoke now, being quenched. And Jesus comes along and Jesus teaches us that he will not break you or snuff you out when you're at your weakest point. And I thank God for that. This has touched my heart this week because we walk in the midst of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. I had two young people come up to me this week, Jehovah's Witnesses. I was at the donut shop. You know, you know I do that. Getting a donut and getting coffee. I won't just say coffee, I'll be honest. I think I got a donut. And uh, I suddenly heard behind me, Hello, sir. How are you? Friendliest voice I think I've heard in a long time. Besides my dear wife. You know, and hello, sir, how are you? I turned around, there was this girl, she couldn't have been more than 16 years old, all dressed up. And I looked behind her and I saw an older woman sitting in a car behind her. And she said, I have something I'd love for you to read. She said, it's all about the Word of God, wouldn't you agree? And I looked down and I said, who is it that you represent? And she said, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, oh. And as soon as I said that, I went into attack mode. I just kind of looked at her and I said, let me tell you some things about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, apparently you're in training and I want to help you. And I started talking about the author of the Jehovah's Witnesses, where they were doctrinally wrong, and blah, 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 blah. And she started backing up, you know? And she's like, okay, all right, sir. And I said, I have something I want to give to you. Oh, no, oh, no. See, they're not allowed to take anything. And when they go to the Kingdom Hall, they're not allowed to say anything or ask questions. They are just instructed as what to do. She slid into the car, still thank you, sir, thank you for taking time with me. And she went in there, and they drove off. Now, you might think, and when I was a younger man, I might have said, yes, I let her have it. But I was thinking about bruised reeds. I was thinking about smoldering wicks. And I said, Jesus is saying, I've come with mercy, I've come with grace, I've come with kindness. It's not time to judge yet. And even though the Word of God says that we're not to bid them God's speed or tell them to have a great day, I could have been kinder, but I wasn't. Yesterday, I'm getting air in my tire, and I hear, Hello, sir. And I was like, Oh, no. I looked up. There was a 20-year-old young man, good-looking kid, dressed up with a tie. He was sharp, and he said, I've got something for you. And I said, who do you represent? <laughs> he said, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I went, and then I stopped. I said, you know what? You look like a fine young man. You look like you're very intelligent. I said, you are probably just getting involved with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, I have some sons. I have a daughter. I said, I want to help you. I said, let me share some things with you. And I shared some things with him from my heart. And he was polite. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. What's your name again? I said, Gary. He asked what I did for a living. <laughs> and I told him. And he slowly backed off and he left and he got in his car. I'd love to tell you that he fell to his knees on the pavement and received Christ at that moment. No, he didn't. But I walked away happier, feeling like I reflected more of the love of Christ, in that maybe now, because of the love, he might evaluate what I had to say, more so than the girl that I let her have it with my machine gun. You know? And I think that's what Jesus is teaching us here in this place. 
Listen to what com one commentator said that I thought was so cool. The smoldering wick on a candle. He says, is there anything closer to death than a smoldering wick? Once a flame, now flickering and failing. Still warm from yesterday's passion, but no fire. Not yet cold, but far from hot. It's no wonder widows, orphans, the imprisoned, those existing in nursing homes, rehab centers, those dying in hospitals, are all part of the crew that Jesus thinks on. But in context, he's talking about religious leaders who hated his guts, who thought that he was of Satan, who disclaimed everything he did. He said, they're bruised reeds. They're smoldering wicks. I care about them. And I'm waiting on them to respond. And I have to believe, as I look at the text, he was also talking about carnal believers who kind of got saved, they're going to heaven, and then they went their own way. I think he's talking about the lost out there who think there is no God, or if he is out there somewhere, you can't really know him. I think Jesus said, I love them too. And I'm waiting on them. And I'm here with mercy and grace right now. I have not come to judge right now. That will come one day. But right now, I'm showing love. And I thought, boy, what a lesson for believers. Rather than letting it rip with our spiritual machine gun, giving the truth in love and letting people know what they need and how they should respond to Christ. So I want you to notice a couple of things this morning. Number one, Christ is describing people. Matthew 9 and verse 36, if you want to follow on the PowerPoint or look it up, hopefully you have something to take notes with. Matthew 9 and verse 36, Jesus overlooked the city of Jerusalem and it broke his heart. It says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, and that could be us this morning, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. Sometimes believers won't do the work of Christ, so God says if they won't do it, pray that I would send people in who would become born again, who would get excited about the things of God, and that they would share the gospel with people. As well as the physically strong, we find Jesus is looking at the defiant. He's waiting, and he's drawing people in. How many illustrations do we have in the Bible of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks? How many illustrations do we have sitting in this sanctuary this morning? of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. Sometimes we don't even know the bad shape we're in and what we need from Almighty God. I listed out a few people. What about the adulterous woman who was caught in the very act of adultery? It was a setup so that they could entrap Jesus and see if he would uphold the law of Moses and allow her to be stoned. She was bruised. She was a smoldering wick. Her little bit of smoke that was emerging from her life was about to go out. But she was laid at the feet of the merciful, gracious one, the Lord Jesus Christ. What about, I relate to short people, what about the short little tax collector named Zacchaeus who climbed up in the sycamore tree? He wasn't big enough to see Jesus come by. He wasn't big enough to see the words on the screen. Right? And he climbed up there, and Jesus was in the midst of hundreds of people. And as Jesus walked by, I love when he stopped. He stopped, he looked up. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. Nobody loved Zacchaeus. They hated him. He was the worst of the worst. 
But Zacchaeus came down quickly, brought Jesus back to his house, gave him a meal, he rejoiced, he repented of his sin, gave back fourfold the people he had cheated, and salvation came to that house that day. What about the man who had the withered hand? He walked around with a withered hand. Just basically a hand sticking out probably from this region of his arm. He couldn't work a job. He couldn't hug his wife. He couldn't hug his kids. People told him he was cursed of God and he was useless. He got invited to temple one day by the religious leaders. Again, not because they loved him or cared for him, but they wanted to entrap Jesus. Hoping because Jesus was a lover of men, a lover of bruised reeds and smoldering wicks, that Jesus would have to respond. So we find that Jesus came and he did respond. And he called the man to the front, told him to stretch forth his hand. Sounded like a cruel joke. But as he stretched it forth, it grew. And it became whole because he stood before the Creator and one who loved him. And one who wasn't there to judge, but to give mercy and grace and the religious leaders in the back that said, aha, we knew he'd love, we knew he'd do that. Jesus loved them too. Should he have loved them or should he have just struck them dead on the spot? He loves everyone who he has created. A son named Mephibosheth in the Old Testament who was a son of King Saul. And somehow he had acquired a limp he was bruised. And David suddenly one day said, search the countryside and find out if there are any relatives of the late king. That would normally scare people because they would kill those relatives, being afraid that they would be a challenge to their own kingdom. But you know what David said? David said, you're going to come and sit at my table from now on. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to treat you as a son because... You're a bruised reed. You are a smoldering wick. And the Bible says, Mephibosheth ate at the king's table from there on out and was part of the family. And David being a picture there of the Lord Jesus Christ. How exciting is that? The guy in the Old Testament, Jabez, smothered by genealogies, his name meaning pain, being mocked, and being treated unkindly by people, suddenly he says, I can't take it anymore. And he stops and looks up and he cries out to God. And it's almost as though God in heaven says, Shh, Jabez is praying. Jabez is praying. I want to hear this. And when he hears Jabez's prayer, he answers his prayer in its entirety because he had been in pain for so long. He was a bruised reed. He was a smoldering wick, but God loved him. What about the woman of Samaria who would come to the well at noontime, the hottest part of the day, to draw water because she didn't want to come early when the other women were there because the women would have mocked her because of her lifestyle and because of her sin and because of her choices. She had never learned how to love or be loved she had never learned what her purpose was. But in John 4.4, 4, Jesus said, I need to go to Samaria. And he met up with her at the well, and she talked about the well, Jacob's well, and he talked about living water, and she said, oh, I need some of this water, so I don't need to come and draw the water anymore. And Jesus said, that's not the kind of water I'm talking about. I'm talking about living water that will spring up into eternal life. You see, when you taste of Jesus, you never thirst again. You have eternal life, and you have some wonderful things happening in your life. Throughout time, broken men, broken women, I happen to be involved in the last, I don't know, 15 years especially, with a lot of broken men and a lot of broken women, and that goes on today, held in the bondage of addiction, self-medicating, broken, 
so many people that I have known through the last 15 or 20 years that are no longer in this world, and they were young men and women. They took their lives, they passed away, they overdosed. They were bruised reeds, and they were smoldering wicks, and I wish we even had the excitement of the young Jehovah's Witnesses I met, that we would share what we have and how Jesus is merciful and gracious and give them what they need. Sometimes we have difficulty even being in God's house. How are we going to reach out to those who have been cast away? People need a touch of the Master's hand. Amen? And who is going to do it if we do not do it? Secondly, the patience of Jesus in the text. Aren't you glad you have a patient God? I don't know what he would have done to me already if he was not patient. Haven't you talked to people sometimes and they say, I'm just waiting for the big boot to come down out of heaven? You know, other people who don't understand hell, yeah, well, it'll be one big party down there. All my buddies will be there. Why would I want to go anywhere else? They don't understand. Other people who say, I've got my hell right here on earth. Do they really, if you've ever read about hell in the Word of God? They are bruised reeds. They are smoldering wicks. They need Jesus. I used to have a youth group in West Bridgewater, Massachusetts, had about 40 kids, and I had the captain of the basketball team. He was the son of the pastor, and I told you stories about him. His name was Lyle Armstrong. He's a missionary to Lebanon now. He used to reach his friends. Every week we had kids from Brockton that came into our youth group simply because Lyle says, you need to hear about Jesus. Come here, my youth pastor. And they'd bring people. He didn't say, oh man, you ought to taste the popcorn. You ought to see the refreshment time. You ought to see the cool stuff we do, even though we did some cool stuff. He said, you need to come and hear about Jesus. He was honest about it. He was open about it. It is possible to see God's power do something in the lives of people. So Matthew 12 and verse 20, the patience of Jesus in the text it says a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. A bruised reed he will not break. Not sometimes he'll break it. When necessary, he won't break it. He won't. Under no circumstances will he break that reed. A smoking wick he will not quench. Who is this Jesus, whose love and judgment are tempered by mercy and grace. Who is this Jesus that in the Bible, and you probably remember this, they blindfolded him and they slapped him. And they said, if you're the Son of God, who slapped you? Who is this Jesus when he was up on the cross and they said, if you be the Son of God, come on down. Aren't you glad he didn't come down? Aren't you glad that he was up there performing the atoning work of God and he had to die if our sin was going to be taken care of? Aren't you glad he stayed there? Aren't you glad he knew his mission? Aren't you glad that he came to die and to love us to the end? I sure am glad because you know why? I'm unlovable. And if we be honest, go home, look in the mirror at yourself and think about your worst day and who you are and what's on the inside and the mistakes you made, you're unlovable too. Oh, we find people who will love us regardless of our scars and our problems, but God loves us with all that stuff intact. He loves us anyway. Born in sin, marred by abuse, difficulties in our life, God still loves us. He could have struck down the disobedient immediately with sudden judgment. He could have responded in the worst of ways when people mocked him, but he didn't. He goes on in the book of Revelation. Remember I talked about Revelation 3.20? He stands before his seven churches in Asia Minor. Remember that? He stands before them and he reasons with them. 
He reasons with them. Here are some of the things that took place. The first two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were commended. They didn't seem to have any known sin or negative things going on. He commended them. They were doing a great job, but he went on and then spoke to Ephesus. Ephesus was actually the first one he spoke to. They were doing a good job, but they had become mechanical. They knew what to do, but it wasn't coming from their heart. And he said, I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. And that was a problem as he stood there. He went on to a church called Pergamos. He talked to them about their idolatry, their sexual immorality, and their false doctrine. He went on and he talked to a church called Thyatira. Thyatira meant continuing sacrifice. There were actually churches that were preaching Jesus on the cross over and over and over and over again. Today we call it Mass. And he told them that what they were doing was wrong. You're crucifying the Son of God afresh. He is not there. He's risen. And that's why I love the empty cross and the empty tomb. One dear lady at Taunton State Hospital, when I was reading to them some scripture this past week, she said, I want to hear the chapter about the empty tomb. I said, wow. And I thought, you didn't come up with that on your own. God laid that on your heart, because it's so cool when they ask. Amen? And then I could answer. It was just a great thing. The Church of Sardis. A name that they were alive but dead. Jesus said, you think you have a name that you're alive but you're dead. You know what that can be equated to? The Protestant churches. We pulled away from Catholicism. We're alive. We have a name. Have you gone into some Protestant churches in the last ten years? They're no different than Catholicism. They think they're alive because they pulled away from Catholicism, but Christ said, you're dead. Your hearts are not alive unto me. So he spoke to the church at Sardis. He spoke to the largest church ever, Laodicea, which is on the scene in our world today. They were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm, and Christ said, you make me sick exactly what he said, and I'm saying it in nice terms, okay? Christ patiently told these seven churches of Asia, whom I love, I rebuke. Remember your first works and return to them. They were bruised reeds. They were smoldering wicks. Some of them were involved in some vile sin, but Christ loved them. And he said, come on, return, repent. Hey, Christians that aren't stirred up about the things of Christ, come on, return. Do the work I've called you to. Folks, this is a short life. And I know we think that means I have to do what I think is important as fast as I can. No, it means acknowledge the God of the universe and please him, and he will make your life something special. He will not bring forth judgment as he addressed these churches. He wanted to redeem them. He did not want to annihilate them. The third, excuse me, the third thing, Jesus is describing specific places. And foreigners. Do you know we're foreigners? Are you a Gentile? Anybody, we have any pure Jews here? If you're not a pure Jew, you are a Gentile. The Jews looked at you in the Old Testament, New Testament as dogs. You were the worst of the worst. Boy, when Jesus came and the death, burial, and resurrection took place, and suddenly Gentiles were brought into the fold, a wild branch grafted into the vine of Israel... They were shocked. They were prejudiced. They did not want to get involved with Gentiles. Aren't you glad that Christ got involved with us? 
that we could be saved too and be part of all that. Matthew 12 and verse 41. It says, the men of Nineveh, you've all heard of Nineveh, right? The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Christ said, you won't listen to me. But a whole city responded to a few words from a very angry prophet named Jonah. And all the people who reject Jesus and don't live fully for Jesus, you know what Jesus said will happen one day? All the hundreds of thousands of people from Nineveh will stand up and rebuke the ones who rejected God because they became believers. They were the worst of the worst. I've got a list, and I'm not going to take your time to read it right now, of what Nineveh and the people of Nineveh did to their enemies, did to people. I do not want to cause you to get nauseous concerning what they would do in battle and how they hurt people and defamed them and abused them, what they did to foreign kings, what they did to foreign soldiers and women. It was not pretty. And Jesus said they will rise up in judgment. A hundred years after Jonah preached, these people went back to the way they were. And the city was destroyed. And we read about that in Nahum. Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Grievous sexual sin. It's where righteous Lot resided. Sexual immorality of the worst kind. Yet God allowed Abraham to debate with him. Remember? Abraham said, Lord, uh, if there be 50 there, will you uh, let them off the hook? And he went to 45. He went to 40. He went to 30. He went to 20. He went to 10. God said, if there be 10 there, I will not destroy the city. Well, you know what's interesting? Lot had, most people think, just two daughters, but they're listed as virgins, and then two son-in-laws are listed, so there had to be two other girls. So that adds up to eight. So all they needed to find was two more people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and God would have spared the city. Shows you how vile they were but they were bruised reeds and they were smoldering wicks about to go out and God loved them. Remember Ruth and Naomi? Remember them in Moab? God loved Ruth. God loved Naomi. Remember Rahab inside the walls of Jericho, a prostitute? That was her profession. She was a bruised reed. God loved her. Remember Hannah longing for a son and Samuel was given to her? She was a bruised reed. Remember Hagar and Ishmael who were driven out into the wilderness by jealous Sarah? And God found them out in the wilderness and talked to them and ministered to them and made promises to them. Folks, there are a lot of bruised reeds in the world today. And by the foolishness of preaching, I'm talking to you about this. I hope it grabs your heart. I hope it means something to you. We are not praying for perfect people to come into our church. They don't exist. I used to talk to pastors who said, wow, sharp couple came into church Sunday. Lady, nice dress, guy with suit and tie. And I'm thinking, sharp couple. I just want people who have a heart that's beating. I don't care what they've done. I don't care where they've been, and I wasn't always that way. But I know that people are bruised, and their smoke is going out, and they're going to pass out into an eternity where there's no, Je no Jesus in their life. And I want to see them come to Christ and become part of the forever family. But I want to mention to you folks, 
He's not judging right now. It's still mercy, grace, the church age. But one day, Christians will stand before this same Jesus. And he'll say, what did you do with me? How faithful were you to my church that I died for? How faithful were you sharing the gospel? How faithful were you bearing your heart to those Jehovah's Witnesses that came your way? They were just kids. Did you love them? Did you show mercy? Did you show compassion? You didn't have to agree with them. And one day the lost will stand again before the righteous judge, Jesus, and he will no longer be administering grace and mercy. He will be judging. Do you realize this is a wonderful time we have right now to say whosoever will can come into the forever family. Whosoever will should consider these bruised reeds and these smoldering wicks. I was one of them. How about you? I'm not pointing at people and I don't know where they're coming from. I remember my sin quite well. How about you? Thank God for the forgiveness that comes and the love from Jesus. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment. This is a serious time, invitation, where we make decisions for Christ. And I hope that you can not worry about the person in front of you or behind you, but see where you stand with God. You are his hands, you are his feet, you are his voice. And there are people that are bruised around you, and there are people who are about to go out into eternity, these smoldering wicks. And maybe you're here today, you have some people on your heart and mind, Not an easy message for me to preach today. Except we're on the receiving end. We've received him. And now we need to be faithful with the salvation that he's given. Maybe God's speaking to your heart today and by an uplifted hand you say, Pastor, just keep me in prayer. I'm in the midst of people like that. I see your hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your heart. I really do. And we want to see some good things happen because we have a merciful Savior. We have a God. His holiness has been violated. And I don't care how good you think you are, we're sinners. And if we've offended in one point, we've offended in everything. And yet God loves us and God waits. Father, we thank you. We were so bruised. I still work with people right now, Father, that are extremely bruised. And their wick is smoldering and their life is going to end some point, some sooner than others. But Father, it's not just them. It's the people who think they're righteous. It's the people who have claimed salvation and yet they don't have a burden. It's the CEOs of companies and those who own million dollar homes who think they're good and they're being blessed and they don't know Jesus. They're bruised and they're smoldering. And we think they're fine and sometimes we even envy them. They're not fine. Please, Lord, wake us up. Please cause us to realize that you're the creator and that people have been born dead in trespasses and sins. They need a savior. It's not about a material stuff, even though you meet our needs. Please, Lord, wake us up. Father, I pray for it all the time. I send out emails and I send out texts and we have Bible studies and we do things to the best of our ability to see people wake up. Father, please, we want to see people come to you. 
If you're patient and waiting, we should also. Thank you now. Thank you for the folks that raised hands and those that didn't. If you've moved on their hearts, thank you. We love you and we thank you for loving us first. We ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you.